past couple of days, uh, I, got, I got a little sick. And they sent me to the, to the doctor, and the doctor said, I need you to stay overnight at the hospital. And there was nothing bad. Just, I just had a little kind of thing going on. So I told that lady, I said, now look, this is Easter. This is a Super Bowl, and I'm the starting quarterback. <laughs> and she said, I know, but your health is important. I said, my health is going to be fine. You pump me full of them bags of stuff, and I'll be ready to go. <laughs> so I'm ready to go. How about that? Amen. Come on. Now, I will tell you this, and I just, you know, transparency is good. I don't like change. Amen. <laughs> Some of you are just that way. I'm, I'm more of a traditionalist. I like certain things. I don't like going to the grocery store and have to check myself out. I want the lady or the fellow to say, hey, how are you today? And they're, they're rolling my bread and my potatoes and all that. How you doing? Good to see you. Come back and see us sometime. I like that. I don't like to go over there and get lost and still have to get somebody to come look at you. And they push a bunch of buttons like you're supposed to know what to do. You know, I've been doing that with them now, and I haven't got a W-2 from them yet. <laughs> I figure they want me to show up and unload the truck tomorrow. I don't know. I don't like that change. I don't like that change. You go to a certain restaurant that says, Cash not accepted. Well, if my cash is not accepted, neither am I. I'm gone, okay? That's just my two cents. And I'm sure there's some things that change has come about in life that you don't necessarily like, okay? And we're all there. Now, you may think you're on the cutting edge, but really and truly, you can be kind of in your own mindset of how doing things. But let me tell you a change that I do like. I like the change that Jesus makes in people's lives. Many of you, if not most of you, are sitting here this morning. God has done something in your heart and your life, and it's changed you for the better. If you've been saved, there's been a change. No matter what your background, what your past, how minor or how major it would have been, God's been a gracious God, and he's, if he's forgiven you and he's come in your heart, there's been a change. I like those changes. Sometimes they're sudden. Sometimes they take a little bit of time getting going. You know, but we look around, um, our world's in a state of calamity. The empty tomb, let me help you with this. The empty tomb of Jesus has been empty for 2,000 years. And Easter is about change. Jesus is a change agent. Please understand that. Easter is about change, and Jesus is that change agent. Just think, if all the world leaders got right with God, if our national leaders, if our corporate executives, if all the school employees, the people you work with in your job, if the moms and dads got all right with God, and if all the families really got right with God, what would we see? I think we would see a worldwide revival. I really do. That we would see morals set straight, Life would be enjoyable. People would care for each other. We wouldn't have murder in the streets, scandals in politics, poor work environments, or shattered families. But more and more, we've lived through the pandemic. We've made our way through that. Difficult times on that. Some of you were there when we did the service outside at the Vista Ridge or Music City Mall. Who went to that service outside? How did you amen me when that happened? You honked your horn. And there's a picture of me on the hillside, and I've got my hand stretched out like this, and there's cars all out there, and the picture is from behind me. Well, Andy Eads is our county judge, and he liked that photo so well. He said, I want to put that in the historical documents of Denton County, how that y'all made it through during the COVID and during the Easter time. And I'm thinking, well, how great is that? I'm in that picture, but it's just my backside. Now, how did that work out? <laughs> I would change that if we could turn me around, hey, kind of thing. But we've gone through some of that. In recent days, there's been difficult days. You can't even watch the news. Somebody's bombing or somebody's hurting. Somebody's getting shot. It's just all this stuff in the world. And another an agenda from the White House is not going to fix it. Another peace treaty overseas is not going to fix it. Jesus is what fixes things. 
And though, even though they think that we may be out of date, but we're really on the cutting edge of this. When people get right with God, there is truly a change. Now, I've got a lot of verses to turn to, so you may not be able to follow. So just listen for if you don't mind. This Easter, let me give you just a backtrack for a moment. Jesus was born of a virgin. He was planned in eternity. God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Sent him at just at the right appointed time, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 4, that is. Galatians 4, 4. Born of a virgin, lived a great, perfect life, sinless life. Gets to begin his ministry at the age of 30. His mom's there at the beginning of his ministry as he turns the water into wine. She follows him. He, he gains followers. And finally, at the end, we find he's being betrayed. He tries to pray in the garden. He comes out of the garden, and they, here they come to arrest him. Oh, Peter, oh, hot-headed Peter, he takes a, a sword, and he cuts off the ear of a man named Malchus. The ear falls to the ground. I can see this. It's not in the Bible, but let me do this. Jesus reaches down with a five-second rule, picks it up, and puts it back on his head. He said, Peter, simmer down. I got this. But he goes through a mockery of trials, and then he gets to be proclaimed guilty, yet he'd done nothing wrong. Yesterday evening, I was at home for a little bit, and I was flipping through the channels, and I saw Passion of the Christ. I said, oh, I like that movie. I mean, it's a tough movie, but I like watching that movie. I turn it over and it was on my channel, channel 10. Well, that's the Spanish channel. Well, that was just at the time they were beating him as he was hanging on the stump. And they were beating him and scourging and whipping and all that. And even though the language was in Spanish, I knew exactly what was being said. And my heart bled, my heart hurt. For what he did for us. Not only did he, he go to the cross, but even prior to the steps before the cross, he was beaten unmercifully, spit upon and cursed in every way possible. And yet he went to the cross. His mother at the, at the foot of the cross, he said, John, that's my mom. Now you take care of my mom. And she watched her son die. Laid him in a grave. It was a borrowed grave. And three, three days later, he comes out of that grave. The stone is rolled back and Jesus is alive. There's various sightings later on. He calls his men together. He has, he has bread and fish waiting on the, on the seashore for them. It's a tremendous that there's verification of all that that really happened. Why did he do that? Because he could bring change to this. He died on the cross to forgive you of sin. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no for, forgiveness of sin. And you can say, well, I mean, I pastor, I've gone to church. I put a dollar in a plate and I've done my best. That's not good enough. When you say, I need Jesus in my heart, and you bow your heart, your head and your heart, before the Lord, he comes in your life. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus is poured over you. Not literally, but you get that. That is taking away your sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no, no forgiveness. But more than just sometimes we talk about getting to heaven, having Jesus and going to heaven. I know that's a sweet by and by, but we live in the nasty now and now. So we've got to deal with something. Jesus himself said this. He said, I, the thief comes... But for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. The old devil wants to kill. The old devil wants to destroy. The devil wants to bring you down and keep you depressed and push you away. Jesus says, I'm going to come into your life today, not just for you get to heaven, but right now. Some of you need to understand this. Well, you know, church is about religion and religion about going to heaven and all that. And I know where that's going. But really and truly, it's about Jesus being alive. and It's more than religion. It's a relationship, relationship with our Savior. He comes in and he gives us that life and gives it abundantly. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect because some days are not so good. But on those not so good days, I know who's standing with me. Amen for that. He said, I've come to, to give them life and life more abundantly. And I want to talk about that change. Remember, I said that change is not necessarily good but change is exactly what God brings. He's an agent of change. Here it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if there's any person saved, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. The old is put away. It's buried. It stinks. It's sorry. It's rotten. We bury the old person. The old person is, is a sinner by nature. 
and we bury the old things, bury it away, and all things have become new. We're new in him. We have been made fresh. We have a fresh start. The old man is dead. The old nature, sin nature is dead. And it's because he lives. He is the Savior. His, his crucifixion, dying for our sins, his resurrection validated, proved he's God. And you can say it all day long, but you prove it when you walk out of that grave. He walked out, and it just guaranteed my salvation. It guaranteed what he's done for me. Colossians chapter 3, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, watch this, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. People don't like to hear that idea, but God's not happy the way the world's going. But he says now, because who you are and saved, you're Christ. He's, in Christ, he said, you used to, I put that in capital letters, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Once you're saved, there's a change. You used to do this. I've heard people say, well, I, you know, I used to do whatever. I used to do some things. Yesterday, I was driving home around my little neighborhood, and there was this guy jogging. Oh, man, he, he was strutting it out. He was, I mean, he's long and lanky. He had muscles all, how he had it going on. And I drove by, and I said, I used to do that. Yeah. Well, you used to. He said, you used to live in the, in the wrong way. He said, but now you must rid yourselves of such things as this. Here in the Bible, there's a bullet point list. He was PowerPoint before PowerPoint come out. Watch this. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its cre of the image of its creator. First Timothy chapter one, and following this, verse 12 through 15, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful or trustworthy, as some scripture says, counting me faithful, putting me in the ministry. That's my ministry verse, by the way. But the one here's what follows this. I was once a blasphemer. I was once a persecutor. I was once a violent man, but I was shown mercy. That's past tense. I was once a dirty, rotten, stinking sinner, but God changed my life. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, Paul says, of whom I am the worst. Titus 3, 5 says, he saved us not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. I deal with people every day. And many say, well, you know, I hope to get to heaven. I don't get you know, wound up in church, but I hope I get there. Well, what are you trying to do? Do you do? Well, you know, I, I'm not as bad as some people, and I try to be moral, and, and all those little things don't add up. Until you say, I need Jesus, and Jesus is in my heart, that's the answer. Anything besides Jesus, you're wrong, okay? Not to debate, not to argue, just that's the bottom line. He said, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That is very narrow. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. When Jesus is really in your heart and you've been saved and born again, there's some changes that begin to happen. Sometimes it happens quickly, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get going. Now, most of us are spoiled. Most of us have a microwave in the house. You put a little bag of popcorn in there. You don't even have to know how many minutes to do it. You, you push the word, popcorn. And it pop, pop, pops, and you're going, well, hurry up. And it takes three or four minutes to pop that popcorn. Some of the, of the younger generation, they, you've missed the blessing of Jiffy Pop. It's a little silver, a little aluminum thing. You pop it over the fire and you, and you pull back the, the foil. Oh, it was good back then. You could really burn it right. Yeah, I mean, amen for that. But we're spoiled. We want an instant. We, let me do it and let me do it right now. And some things, it does happen that way when God begins to change your life. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time depending who you are and how stubborn you are. Here we go. Number one is your heart. Psalm 51, verse 10. The psalmist says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. When you have a clean heart, you have a different look on life. Your heart's dirty and filthy and nasty. You say, well, I've done a pretty good job. Yeah, but down in that deep recessed part that nobody knows about but you and God, it stinks. He said, Create in me a new heart. And when there's truly a change in your heart, life, you're saved, 
He creates a new heart and there's a new life. Second thing, a mind. Your mind, what you're thinking. Romans 8, 6 says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Some of you don't have that peace. You don't, don't sleep good at night. You toss, you turn, you worry, you fret. You got all kinds of things going on. Let me show you the next verse. He said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The more you know him, the more he knows you. And the easier it is to have this peace of mind. Now, let me just ask a question. Who in here has been married more than 40 years? Raise your hand. Put it down. Who's been married more than 50 years? Raise your hand. Who's been here married more than 60 years? Amen. Now, those of you who've been married for some time, two or three things start happening. One, you start looking alike. Oh, Lord. <laughs> but the other side is you can finish each other's sentences. You know that, don't you? You will start something and she can finish it or vice versa. Because you know each other that well. Y'all been together for 40, 50, 60 or more years. You just know each other. You know, when they're young and married, she'll look at him and say, what are you thinking about? <laughs> I'm sorry, honey. He's not thinking about you. He's thinking about who's playing football. And what he's thinking. But when you've been married 40, 50, 60 years, she doesn't say, honey, what are you thinking about? She's going to say, would you get your mind back here? I got things to do. Because she knows you. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. He begins to change your mind. When you get close to him, you get in God's word and you understand it. You begin to think more like him and it begins to work that way. Romans 12, 2 said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me give you another word. The word is mouth. Psalm 40, verse number three says, he put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust the Lord. Puts a new song. Now, have y'all ever had that song that just sticks in your head at night and you can't get it away? Right in the middle of the night, you're going, jingle bells, jingle bells. <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah. Now, some of you of an older generation, you may get catch some of this. I said that same thing in the first service and after the service, one person came to me and she said, when I saw you walk out with that, pink, a white jacket and a pink corsage, I could think of was Marty Robbins, a white sport coat and a pink carnation. She said, that's been going through my mind. I said, you not hear the sermon? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Ephesians 4, 29 said, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, sometimes people say, well, that just means cursed words. no. Sometimes people, are, today people want to cut people down. Don't watch late night TV shows, you know? These, uh, these guys over here with a little desk who think they know everything and try to influence the political world and everything else. They want to cut everybody down, whatever side of the camp they happen to be on. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Listen to your kids, to your grandbabies, to your spouse, to your, your friend at work to your pastor, to your neighbor. Don't let any, but whatever is helpful in building others up, encouraging and blessing, there's the change that comes in your mouth. You don't say the things you used to say. And this is in life in general. Colossians 3, 1 says, since you've been raised with Christ, here it is, you've been raised with him. When you're saved, you're raised with him. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, as Jesus changes lives, when you kneel down, either physically or just in your mind, you kneel down before the Lord. God, I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten, stinking sinner. I'm so sorry. If you pray that a real, genuine, sincere, heartfelt prayer, when you stand up, you're no longer a sinner. You're a winner. You belong to God. You're one of his children. And here's some things. There should be a livelier step in your walk because you are now clean and forgiven. You don't have the baggage. You don't have to guilt trip. You don't have to be looking over your shoulder. You don't have to say, well, you know, I got skeletons in that closet now. What, what, what will somebody say? Watch this. I don't care what somebody says. My Jesus said, you're now clean and forgiven. You're, it's all erased. It's erased. It's done. 
When I was a little boy, some of you probably had them. Even nowadays, they got that Etch-a-Sketch. You know what that thing is? And, and I never could make a picture of it. All I did was staircase all the way up. But you didn't like it. You turned over, you and you start all over, okay? Let God and help you start all over. Be clean, clean and forgiven. There should be a livelier step. There also should be a, a sense of self-confidence. I don't mean braggadocious or bold, but in the sense of who you belong to. I'm a part of the royal family. My heavenly father is God. I have the authority, the right to walk boldly into the throne room of grace. I don't have to wait on somebody. I don't have to wait on a certain day, a certain time, certain place. I was in Mexico many years ago, in Monterey, Mexico. We went to a, a certain church, and they had removed an idol from inside there, and the lady was outside crying. And I said to the missionary, I said, why is she crying? I said, because she feels she can't pray because that, that statue's no longer there. Let me tell you, you don't need to pray to a statue. You pray to the God Almighty himself. Amen. Amen. Because you belong to him. My gosh. When there's that real change in your heart, you say, I belong to God. I'm one of his, his children. There's a sense of purpose. God has a plan for your life. For some, it's just, well, you get up, you eat, you go to work, you sleep, start all over tomorrow. And you kind of get to be dull and bored, bored in that. But let God bring life to you. Yeah, you still got to eat, you still got to go to work. But there's a different step about you. You're a different person. For some, you may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees. You may be the only Bible anybody ever reads. Say, well, you don't know the bunch I work with, and you're just the one that needs to be there. You need to rise above. Don't let them pull you down. You pull them up. And that all brings me to the next point. There should be a willingness to help others because of what he's done for you. Jesus was the epitome of a servant leader. Just days before his crucifixion, he's on his knees on an old dirty floor washing the feet of his disciples. Now, these are stinking fishermen. Been trading with him for three years now. Dirt, dust, grime, oh, nasty toes. And he's washing their feet. I don't think he's trying to scrub them up, trying to get them clean. He's doing gently. He's showing his love and compassion. See, when there's a change in your heart, you will serve and you'll try to do for others. What can I do for you? How can I help you along the way? It's not about me. It becomes about you. And that change is real and it's very genuine. Then another one is to say, there should be a passion to see someone saved. If God saved you, you're part of the kingdom of God, the family of God. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to heaven. He's pr preparing a mansion for you. Amen. What about your grandkids? What about your children? What about your brothers or sisters, your husbands or your wives, your mom or dad? What about the person you go to work with eight or nine hours a day? The person behind you that's a neighbor and y'all help each other across the fence from time to time. Do that end with the Lord? When this change comes about, you can't help but express it and tell other folks about it. You can't help but say, you know, hey, let me tell you about the Lord. Let me tell you what he's done in my life. You don't have to be braggadocious. You don't have to say, boy, I'm great now. No, no. God's still working on me. Sometimes changes are instant. And sometimes it takes a while. And I, he's still taking a while on me. I'm finally giving in. I'm finally working this thing out. But you should have a passion to see other folks come to Christ. True statement is when the man of the house, the father, gives his life to Jesus, the family is much more likely to follow suit. Listen to me, fellas. When the man steps up and he leads his family to church, it's not like in the morning. We all, are we going to church, honey? No, it was the night before you said, Get your clothes ready. We're going to church. This is what we do. It's not waiting. We hope somebody comes by to visit. No, you put a sign on the door. We're going to church. We'll be back after Brother King gets finished. Amen. However you want to work that out. Fellas, I need you to step up, okay? Because this is your kids, grandkids. This is your family. And I believe you're held responsible for them. You step up. They should have a passion to see somebody give their heart to Christ. 
For some, you may not ever know. You don't, will never know their name again. But you did something for them. You cared. You prayed. You assisted them along the way. If Jesus is really in your heart, there should be evidence. The evidence of Jesus' resurrection is the empty tomb. The evidence of Jesus in your life is a full heart. And it should be real. People it should be able to show up in your life. So, Pastor, I'm struggling with that. Well, let's help you with that. I'm not beating you up. I want to help you through that. But there's some in this room, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You've never. You've gone to church. You, you know the story of Easter. I knew the story of Easter as a little kid, but I wasn't saved. You may know the story of Easter, but if you're not saved, today is the day to be saved, to give your heart to life to Christ. In a moment, we're going to have people stand. I will be here. Our staff will be here to pray with you, to help you, to trust Christ as your Savior. For others, maybe there's just a special prayer need. For others, it may be it's time for you to become a part of the church family. And I want to talk to you personally about that, your membership, your involvement in our church family. I would love for that to be a part of, part of what we're doing today. To accept the Lord, a very heartfelt prayer would go like this. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. You died for my sins. You're alive today. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Save my soul. You say, you really that simple? It's more than the words. It's in the heart. And when those words are mentioned from the heart, God does a miraculous thing. He changes your heart. He changes your life. And he changes your eternity. I'm going to heaven because of that simple prayer right there that Jesus paid the price for me on the cross. 2,000 years ago. Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, would you speak to every heart right now, please? Some in this room have a deep, desperate need. And I pray that you would just touch their heart, nudge their, their, their themselves right now. Allow them to walk down the aisle to find someone who's kind and compassionate and who can pray for them and pray with them. For some in this room, they've never, never been saved. I pray today could be that day. Or for some, they have been, but it's like the prodigal son, they've gone away. And it's time to come back home. Help them make that step, this, that first one step back is all it takes. And I pray that in Jesus' name.